next lesson, we'll look at the gable roof, which consists of only common rafters with a ridge board and gable end studs. We'll look at the line length of the common rafters, the shortenings that we need to make at the top, vertical plumb cuts, horizontal level cuts, and also the bird's mouth notch that sits over the wall. The carpenter is able to estimate the length of the common rafter without actually doing a lot of calculations. On the framing square, on the outside scale, the inches are divided into twelfths of an inch. So there are twelve separations or twelve spaces in between the inches, inch marks. And we can use that as a scale, each space representing one inch and each inch representing one foot. So if we use the twelfth scale in the framing square, we can hold the, the tape measure on the framing square when the building run is 12 feet. It would be held on the 12 inch mark on the left hand side. And then the rise of 9 feet would be held at the 9 inch mark on the right hand side. So we're using 12 inches on the body, 9 inches on the tongue of the square. And then we can just use our tape measure to measure the diagonal across. In this case it's an exact number of 15 inches which means 15 feet. If we were going to use a run of 12 foot 4 inches, then we would simply hold the tip of our tape at 12 inches plus 4 spaces. And then we would hold it on the right hand side at the appropriate rise, depending on the slope of the roof, and that will give us an estimate for the length of the common rafter. Without doing a lot of math, you can actually determine the length of a common rafter fairly exactly. What you would do is set your stair gauges on your framing square so that one side on the tongue is set at the unit rise and on the body it's set at 12 inches which is the unit run. And then you would step it off in a similar fashion that you would to stepping off uh, for building a set of stairs. You would step it off the required number of runs. In this picture here it's uh, three runs which means that the width of the building is actually six feet. Span equals six feet, run equals three feet. So we have three unit runs, and after you draw the plumb line up at the top, then you just slide your square down exactly three times, and then you can strike off the heel plumb cut line. So the square, it slid down the amount of the projection at the end, and then the tail cut line is struck off, allowing for the fascia board. This is a fairly accurate way of doing it, but at this stage you will need a fairly sharp pencil and uh, in order to save on any mistakes that you might make. When we're going to use a calculator to figure out the length of our common rafter, we can actually use the framing square as an intermediary help. Instead of using Pythagoras to figure out the hypotenuse of the unit triangle, we can go to the framing square and as is pointed out right here, if we have a 612 roof or a 6 in 12, then the very first line of the numbers that are under the 6 reads 1342. So that means that the hypotenuse of a 612 triangle would be 13.42 inches. And if you look at your framing square, you'll see that listed on the tables, it will actually say the length of the common rafter per foot of run. Now these tables are limited to an 812 slope down to a 212 slope, but that's pretty well the range that most of our roofs are going to be cut. If we take a look at the framing square, we'll see that under the number 6 for a 6 and 12 roof slope, the unit common rafter on the first line is 13.42. For a 712 it's 13.89 and for an 812 it's 14.42. So instead of having to go to Pythagoras to calculate out each time what the unit common rafter is going to be, we do that simply by going to the framing square. <clears throat> All the rest of the framing square tables are based, use, are created using Pythagoras' theorem. And uh, we're going to discuss them more in depth as we continue on with the hip rafter and the hip roof. Here we see a common rafter that's been cut to fit from a ridge board running to the wall and sitting on top of the two wall plates. <clears throat> the wall sheathing has been left out for clarity. We can see that the rafter sits directly over the stud so that we get good bearing uh, from the roof load <coughs> straight down to the foundation. We have here also a view where we can see that the theoretical rafter length goes a little bit further than the actual rafter length. The rafter length has to be shortened 
for half the thickness of the ridge board. And we can also see that it's been notched out to make a bird's mouth to sit over the two top plates. This is a diagram of a common rafter layout and we can see starting at the top right at the very edge of the lumber we start off with our first ridge plumb line and it's a ridge plumb cut line where we're going to be cutting the where the rafter will be measured from. Measuring off of that line we will measure the number three which is the line length which we have already calculated. Going back to the top we shorten the length of the rafter by the half the thickness of the ridge board and this is done at right angles to the ridge plumb line. So the ridge plumb line the first line and then we come back three quarters of an inch which is usually half the thickness of an inch and a half thick ridge board and then we make line number two. Number four is made after we have measured out our line length and that would be called the heel plumb line. Coming off of line number four is line number five which is the seat level line and between the two of them we have what's called the bird's mouth. Added on to that we have the tail. We can if we want determine the tail length or if we're using a framing square we can simply slide it out by the projection of the tail. At either rate we were going to have for seven a tail plumb line or a tail plumb cut line and then there will be a level line if we need to adjust it for the fascia which would be point number eight. These are the tools that we use for laying out rafters. One, if, one is the framing square, the rafter square or the steel square as it's sometimes called. And on one arm of this square, the narrow arm, it's called the tongue. The wider one is called the body. The tongue is inch and a half wide. The body is two inches wide. The body is 24 inches long. The tongue is 16 inches long. For laying out a rafter, stair gauges or stair buttons are placed at exactly the correct location and you have to be very careful depending on the type of button that you have as to where you put these buttons. But generally speaking, they'll be placed in a, in a fashion that's shown here. And on the right hand side, which is the tongue, we would put the unit rise of the rafter. And on the left hand side, on the body, we would put the unit run which is always 12 inches. So here for a 612 slope we can actually see the bones laid in place. Once that's put up against the lumber then you can draw your line and that will be your plumb cut for the 612. This doesn't give you the angle but it gives you a line that you can follow with your circular saw. If you were to measure directly between the two stair gauges you would find that distance is exactly 13.42 inches which you can either calculate using Pythagoras or you can read off the framing square tables. The square below is called the speed square. <clears throat> the speed square pivots up at the top that the narrow pencil is pointing to and what you would do is you would pivot it around until you can read on the sc two scales that they have there the slope of the roof that which, with which you're working. In this picture the speed square is set at the number 8 on the lower on uh, the lower scale that's below the slot you'll see the number eight there and that's for the common rafter for an 812 roof and on the bottom of the square you can actually read the number of degrees that you would set your saw at to get that cut so where the wider carpenter's pencil is pointing to you can read 34 degrees and 34 degrees is how you would set your miter saw if you're making a cut for an 8 and 12 roof once we've done the math for the common rafter, then here again is a picture showing you the amount that you need to shorten and why you need to shorten it. So we have our two common rafters budding together perfectly without being shortened, then they would be the exact length. But because we normally have a ridge board that runs right straight through between them, then we have to shorten each common rafter by half the thickness of the ridge. So all the math that we do is really what's called a line length. If the rafter were just a line, that would be the length. After we've got the line length, then we will do a shortening. And the reason we do it that way is because sometimes the ridge board has different thicknesses. So sometimes the ridge board is uh, two inches thick, sometimes three quarters of an inch thick. So depending on what the thickness of the board is, um, that would depend. That would determine how much we're going to shorten uh, the common rafter. 
and it's always measured perpendicularly. So you can see the distance. It's not along the top, along the sloped edge, but it's perpendicular to the initial plumb cut line. We will measure straight back half the thickness of the ridge. Most cases, it's going to be 3 quarters of an inch. This is a photograph of several different types of stair gauges. Uh, some are made by the Starrett Company, which are fairly expensive, but also very, very accurate. There are others that are hexagonal, a pair here that are cylindrical, and then there is a homemade uh, bar, plexiglass bar, that goes across the, the square. The square fits in between two slivers or two pieces of uh, plexiglass, and then it's tightened with uh, butterfly screws. What this will do is allow you to see that uh, through the plexiglass that you're actually exactly on the right numbers. So let's say it's a 10-12 a roof. You want to make sure on the right-hand side that the plexiglass crosses the top of the square by 10 inches, and on the left-hand side it crosses at 12 inches. A pretty useful jig because it allows you to uh, uh, essentially uh, hold it and get a very accurate um, step measurement for you making the rafter. This is a nice slide because it gives you a step-by-step -step exactly what you need to do in order to lay out a rafter. So remember, the very first thing you do is you pick up your piece of lumber, try and get one as straight as possible, but if there is a slight crown to the lumber, make sure that the crown is up so that the weight of the, the dead load on the roof will level out over time. So with the crown up, you're doing your layout marks from the top of the rafter and you're scoring down uh, to make the lines. So the first line would be your first, um, well, the first thing, I guess, would be to make sure your crown is up. The, the second thing is your first ridge plumb cut line. The third thing would be your second ridge plumb cut line. And then fourth, <clears throat> you draw that second line. Uh, I guess third, they say you measure fourth, you draw the second line. And then you, <clears throat> you measure down the full length, the, the calculated length of the rafter, point number five. Draw the heel plumb cut line, point number six, the seat cut line, point number seven. Adding to that the tail, um, which you've calculated as number eight, but you add it on from the heel plumb cut line to the tail plumb cut line, that'll be point number nine. Then the tail plumb cut line itself, number 10, and then the seat cut, number 12. So once you've cut this rafter, this is called the common rafter, and then you use it as a pattern for all the other rafters. So it's very important that the first one is done exactly. <clears throat> what we recommend is that you cut two rafters. So after you've cut one, you cut the second one, and then you put it up and make sure that they fit, because you don't want to cut 20 and find that you're off. So you want to cut two, make sure it's a good, perfect fit, and then you can continue on with the rest. This is just another diagram for setting the top of the ridge board. Remember we had said before that the actual top of the ridge board is going to be higher than the calculated total rise. So first you do your layout for your rafter. <clears throat> you make the notch for the bird's mouth and you measure how much rafter stand is above the bird's mouth, which is the vertical distance uh, straight up from the bird's mouth. You take that number and you add it onto the total rise and that will give you to the top of the ridge board if the ridge board is beveled. So in other words, if it comes to a peak, then that would give you the exact measurement. If you leave your ridge board as a flat top ridge board, then what you're going to have to do is just to read by that little dark black triangle that's uh, that's up there. And that amount is usually given as the unit rise or calculated as the unit rise over 16. So in the example that we have here, if it's an 812 roof, then the amount by which you would drop it would be 8 over 16, which is half an inch. So then the top to the top of a flat ridge board, you're going to have total rise plus rafter stand minus the unit rise over 16. Or in the case of metric, uh, minus uh, 19 over the slope factor. After you've got your rafters cut, and you can actually go ahead and place them, install them on the roof, on the building, and make your roof and then under the rafters at the gable end wall you can install your gable end studs. What we try to do is to line up our gable end studs with the studs that are below them and uh, make sure that they're plumb, perfectly vertical, and then cut them off of the angle at the top to match the roof. So if your roof is for instance a, um, an 812 roof then 
the angle at which you're going to bevel your saw at in order to cut those gable end studs is going to be at the uh, 34 degree angle, which is the angle for an 812 roof. And you can see that they decrease as you go down. Because all of the studs are 16 inch on center, all of the common differences are going to be exactly the same. So in a situation where you have, in, in this example, if the unit rise is 6 inches, that means your roof slope is 6 and 12, then means over 16 inches, the common difference is going to be half of that, which is 8 inches. And so as long as you've figured out the first one, got it in nice and plumb, you can take in 8 inches off and get the second one and so on in order to complete the roof. This is just a quick way to pre-cut all of your studs before you put them up, the gable studs or the gable end studs. Uh, you can see that that first stud is going up with a level, making sure that it's perfectly plumb, making a mark uh, on the underside of the rafter and cutting it to fit and uh, doing that as you go along. Well, knowing that there's going to be a common difference that's exactly the same for all the studs, you can actually lay your boards out in the same fashion and then cut them. Several different ways of doing this. Generally on a job site, you try to use up as much of your short scrap pieces as possible. So down where you have short gable studs, you'll be hunting around for all the scrap pieces. Normally what guys is you just use the miter saw to cut the top angle and then measure the length and cut it square on the bottom. Another way of doing the gable end is instead of cutting the studs individually, what you can do is build an entire triangular frame that is going to go up in one whole piece. This is a lot faster to do. You can get everything done on the ground and actually put your sheathing on while it's on the ground and then lift it up as one piece. Now depending on the size of the house as to how heavy that's going to be, but usually if there's a decent crew of three or four guys you can pick up a gable end quite easily. So here we have a crew that are snapping the lines, uh, the crew snapping the lines on the ground, on the floor, to delineate the marks for the gable end wall. So you'll see what's being done here and then we'll cont continue through these slides. You'll see how it goes up fairly quickly. So after the lines have been made on the floor, then the next thing to do is to lay out two common rafters. And here it's being done with a framing square, a slightly skinnier version than the one we have in Canada. This is in, in China. And after we step it off, step at a time, uh, for every foot we go, we make, we move the square over. Then uh, we count it out. After we've made our marks, then we will actually double check with the calculated measure. So in this slide, what we're doing is double checking the line length of the common rafter. After we've done the math by multiplying the unit common rafter from the, the number of the square, multiplying that number by the run of the building. So if it's a 612 slope and the span of the building is 22 feet, the run would be 11 feet and the line length of the common rafter would be 13.42 times 11, which would give us 12 foot 3 and 5 eighths inches. Here we have a few photographs of cutting the bird's mouth. So the layout marks have already been put in place, and now the lumber has to be secured to the top of the saw horses and then cut with the circular saw. Always try to position yourself in such a way that should the saw kick back, you're out of the line of fire. So notice in the top right hand picture, if the saw were to kick back, the, the fellow using the saw is out of the way. After the saw cuts have been made, then the next step is to finish it up with a hand saw to get a nice notch called the bird's mouth. Now that the two rafters have been cut, they are placed on the floor on the top edge or on the top of the gable, the gable end wall outline. So that outline has been snapped in red chalk on the floor and these two rafters are placed on the top and then between them a vertical piece of wood that's the same thickness and size as the ridge board is going to be stood up to make sure everything is located the way it should be once it gets on top of the roof. What we have here in this picture it's on the floor again and we have two common rafters that meet up at the top at a ridge board a short piece of lumber that simulates the ridge board you can see there's a fellow in a red jacket that's holding it up and then underneath the two common rafters, we now have a top plate and those will form the top plate of the gable end, the triangular wall that we're going to put up. In this photograph you can see the outline of the gable end wall, the triangular wall. There's two top plates that meet just at the ridge board and then on the bottom there is a bottom plate. Now in between these two, uh, the top and the bottom plates, we're going to be putting up the gable end 
studs. Here we're cutting the gable end studs. You can see that the saw is being is tilted at a bevel so that the cut is going to match the angle of the roof, the slope of the roof. And also in order to keep the saw going straight across the lumber, the speed square is being used. So the speed square is actually being held firmly to the lumber and it's used as a guide to keep the base plate of the saw running squarely across the lumber. This is especially important because you're now cutting at a bevel and can cause the saw to bind if you don't go straight. So it's nice to have a nice guide there to help you to go nice and straight across. So this, each of these studs are going to be measured off and cut with the same angle and then they'll be nailed into place. And this is a picture of installing all of the gable end studs. You can see one, uh, one of the carpenters marking it and others nailing the other ones together and marking and measuring and nailing working as a team. Once this is all set into place and we're confirmed that we're still on the red chalk lines, then we can put the sheathing on top of it and then install it into place. So you can see actually that a stud is actually dead center, so it's supporting the ridge board. This semi-detached home was built in Sichuan in China right after the big earthquake. Actually, not right after, it was a year after. The people were all still living in tents and uh, fairly, pretty well at the uh, mercy of the elements. So here we have on the left-hand side is the new homeowner. The carpenter's in the middle and the general contractor from China is on the right. This is a photo of the completed structure. You can see up near the peak, the triangular gable end is held into position by some 2x4s that are nailed on the outside of the wall. When that was lifted up from inside of the building, we didn't want it to fall over onto the ground, so we set up those braces there just to hold it temporarily into place until we were able to secure it to the top plate. So this represents uh, a semi-detached, um, so it's a two-family dwelling. Underneath the dwelling, there, you can see where their garage door opening. That's where they're going to be running their local stores. So generally what happens is that the people live upstairs and the stuff that they sell is being done downstairs in, in an open area with a garage door. The building of this entire structure after the concrete was poured took four days. This was actually a training venture between Canada and China and our, our mission there was to train the local workers how to build wood frame houses. The intent of course that they will purchase their lumber and their OSB from, from Canada. Uh, this took place about three years ago and it's been a hugely successful venture. China is buying a significant amount of lumber from Canada. We can see that uh, the structure is up. They have built some homemade scaffolding to wrap the building and they're up on the roof putting up the tiles and it's a little hard to see but in the big sign that's hanging top left hand corner you can see uh, the maple leaf and it will actually say Canada Wood and it's been sponsored by the Council of Forest Industries. I included this slide at the end this is a slide of the homeowners in China there are three generations living in the same home grandparents children and grandchildren and uh, we have here uh, in four days they've actually going to see themselves shortly moving out of a tent that they've been living in for over a year. They're very happy and it's a very emotional time for them and for us. So as you conclude your study on on the gable roof I have added an assignment. When you go back to the website just click on assignment number three and you will see directions as to how to complete it.